Okay, last lesson for Unit 3, Thermodynamic Material. Uh, this is Section 4, Lesson 2, and this is the STSC reading that's required for this, uh, one of four that's required, and it's entitled, What Fuels You? Now, make sure you go and grab this STSC and, and print it off and read it. Um, I'm just going to give a quick overview of what's in here, but be aware that um, you know, these STA, STSEs are expected to be read, and anything in this is valid for a question. Usually they show up like multiple choice questions and things like that. Uh, but in this particular um, section here, it's not uncommon that you may have a calculation that shows up as part of a long answer question. So uh, let's have a look at it. Here we go. Okay, so once again, it's, uh, we're looking at the STSE, and it's called What Fuels You? And I'm just simply looking at this, and in, in, in that light, I have a little diagram that I just uh, pulled off the web there somewhere, and it's saying, you know, at five pounds of spaghetti, um, that's enough energy to brew a pot of coffee. So that's enough energy to boil that water. Uh, one piece of cherry cheesecake, <laughs> we know there's a lot of calories in cherry cheesecake, right? You can't eat too much of that. It's not very forgiving. Um, there's enough energy in a piece of cherry cheesecake with all the fat and, and, the, and the cheese and whatnot that's in it. Um, to power a 60 watt light bulb for one and a half hours. Amazing. Um, and last but not least there, if you have 217 Big Macs, not all at once of course, but there's enough energy in 217 Big Macs to drive your car for 88 miles. Now obviously this is an American picture because we would say kilometers. So that's about, uh, roughly what, about 130 kilometers I guess. Um, there we go. So, what are we eating? Where's the energy coming from? How do we how do we burn off this energy? We're going to look at some of the activities that we can do here, uh, and how much energy is burned off as we as we engage in some activities. So, let's have a look. Here are the outcomes for this uh, lesson. This is the stuff from the STSE that they expect you to know. Okay, so have a look. Um, the very first thing we're looking at is something called a fuel value. Now, a fuel value um, is Anything that can we derive energy from, like you know, a chocolate bar or a bag of chips or an apple or an orange or a banana or something like that, um, we want to be able to be able to calculate its fuel value. How much energy is it providing to us? How much energy is it providing to our diet? Now, not only is it food materials that we're talking about, for for the most part, we can look at any substance and say what's its fuel value. Like for instance, if we had a container of propane, what's the fuel value of propane, or what's the fuel value of gasoline? Um, normally, what we've been saying is, you know, what's the enthalpy? How much is how much stored energy is there? And we could calculate it in terms of kilojoules per mole. Now, the problems with kilojoules per mole is that not everyone understands the the, the kilojoules. Not too bad. A lot of people reference that to energy, um, but the term moles. A lot of people don't know what a mole is, let alone how to calculate it, or, or even how to calculate the number of moles of something. So to keep things real simple and try and, and um, you know tone it down a little bit from the chemistry perspective, is what we do is we refer to the amount of heat evolved per gram of the substance, which is easier for some people, for, you know, to get our heads wrapped around. You know, if we had if we had one kilogram of propane, and we could figure out how much energy that kilogram of propane can release, then we can easily say, well, what if we had 1.5 kilograms, or what if we had 5 kilograms of propane? Uh, we could easily do the calculations for that. Um, okay, so what we're going to be able to do then is be able to compare different fuels or different food substances based on their mass, which is a lot easier than trying to figure out what chemicals are involved and what molar masses and being able to calculate them all. So you might be saying, well, why didn't we do that at the beginning of the year, sir? Well, because it's not as accurate and it's not as precise as what we want. And, and for us, moles is easy because we've been doing that now for a couple of years, right? So here we go. Um, so the formula is simply fuel value, FV, is equal to the energy that's going to be released by the fuel um, divided by the mass that we've burned. All right, so I could ask you to calculate the fuel value of, say, a marshmallow. And you may have done an experiment in your school where you've taken a marshmallow and you've burned it under a, a can of water and you measured the heat absorbed by the water. And therefore, you could figure out how much energy was released per gram of marshmallow, right? Or cheesy or chip or whatever it is you might want to burn. So again, it's an easier way. And if we could figure out the whole mass of the pack of marshmallows, then we could actually figure out, well, how much energy am I going to eat if I eat the whole package? Right per gram. 
Um, very difficult for us to do kilojoules per mole for a marshmallow because, first of all, we've got to figure out, well, what's the ingredients of a marshmallow? What's in it? What do we calculate the moles of? You see the problems? So by doing fuel values, we simplify the measurements by simply saying, OK, let's weigh a marshmallow. And let's see how much energy that total marshmallow is going to release. So here we go. OK, here's a typical calculation that you might want to do here with fuel values. So we say, OK, here's a juice pack. And this is just an old, any old um, nutrition label. I just pulled this one from a pack of juice that I happened to open up the other day. And it says, OK, I know my, my serving size is 87 grams. And I know the calories that's in this. Now, the, the kilojoules wasn't given. Because generally, food energy originally um, traditionally was measured in calories. So when you say, you know, someone has a pack of chips and a glass of pop or something, you know, how many calories is in that? So when they refer to calories, they're referring to the food energy. Now what we would have to do here is, first of all, I've included the kilojoule. Some food labels do include the kilojoule value. Many of them do not. All right. So how would we be able to turn that into an energy that we can use? Well, the very first thing we have to look at is the conversion to go from calories to kilojoules. And the conversion is basically the heat capacity of water, isn't it, 4.184. So one calorie would, would be the amount of energy that it takes to um, heat up um, one kilogram of water. All right? And whatever that energy is, it works out to be 4.184 kilojoules. So it's a real easy number to, to remember, uh, the heat capacity of water. right? So what we're looking at is, in this particular question, it's saying, OK, if I drink this entire juice pack, that's going to give me 80 calories. So in order for me to figure out my energy in kilojoules, I'm simply going to say um, it's going to be 1 calorie is 4.184 kilojoules. So I'm simply going to multiply 80 calories by 4.184. And what I find is that this works out to be 335 kilojoules of energy. So we can relate that now. Now that it's in kilojoules, we can say, sure, to boil one mole of water, about 18 milliliters of water, because molar mass of water is 18.02, to boil one mole of water takes 40 kilojoules of energy. You can put it in perspective, now, can't you? 18 milliliters of water is about, um, if you had a large drinking glass, it's about a quarter filled drinking glass. That takes 40 kilojoules of energy to boil that water. Um, for us, we're consuming 335 kilojoules. So put it in perspective, right? That's that's a fair bit of energy in that juice pack when you think about it. Okay. Um, now, if we want to figure out the fuel value of the juice, we know that this is the amount of energy that we're getting for 87 grams. When we do a comparison, we want to compare it on the per gram basis. So what we're saying is that 87 grams gives me this much energy. How much would one gram give me? Well, you're simply going to divide that 335 by 87 grams. And lo and behold, that juice pack, in every gram of juice pack, in every gram, you get 3.85 kilojoules. So you might say, well, why would you want to know that? Well, if you're on a strict diet for calorie intake for one reason or another, um, you want to be able to count the number of calories or kilojoules that you're consuming, you may not be allowed to drink that entire juice pack because that may be exceeding your, your caloric or, or energy intake. So what you would do is you could say, well, what if I drank about half of it? Suppose I only drank about 40 grams of this juice. Let me take half the juice box, and I'll only drink 40 grams. Well, now that we have this in kilojoules per gram, one gram gives me 3.85. I know how many kilojoules I'm going to get for 40 grams. It's an easy calculation. Fuel value is Q over M. All right, I want to know what energy I want, so I'm looking for Q. So Q is going to be fuel value times the mass that I'm going to consume here, so 3.85 kilojoules per gram times 40. And if I only consume a little bit less than half the box, I get 154 kilojoules. And if I'm concerned about my calorie intake and that's well within my ballpark, then that's how much juice I drink. All right, there we go. Okay, another way we can use fuel value here is by looking at, say, fuels that we might burn. And why would you want to be concerned about the amount of the, the fuel value of of, um, of fuel for a heating source or for burning in a car or a rocket engine or if you're going to go to the campground and you're going to boil some water, you have to carry fuel with you. 
Um, and that's where it comes to fuel value is a very important thing to know about because if we look at the molar enthalpy of combustion of these different compounds, burning hydrogen, burning methane, propane, butane, octane, that's the gasoline, uh, that's another form of branch chain um, gasoline, right? It's still an octane molecule, C8 molecule, but it's more branched, so it burns more efficiently. And there would be ethanol. So here's the kilojoules. So we're looking at this and we're saying, okay, right now the, the one with the greatest enthalpy would be the, the branched octane. Okay, great. That's the one that would give me the most energy per mole. And that should make sense from this perspective because if we look back at what we were doing with bond energies, up here with hydrogen, we're only breaking a single hydrogen bond. Make no wonder the value is so tiny. We're only breaking one HH bond. In octane, we have to break the bonds between seven C bonds. So C, C bonds, there's seven of them, right? There's uh, 18 CH bonds that have to be broken. So make no wonder this value is so large for the enthalpy of combustion because we're breaking more bonds. So in terms of that, you might say, well, octane is the way to go. Now the problem is the very fact that we had more bonds to break in octane meant octane now is a heavier molecule. So we're saying, hmm. I got to pack this stuff in. I'm going on a great big long hike. I don't want to be carrying gasoline around because gasoline is heavy. You guys know that if you've ever taken a five gallon gas can for your skidoo or whatever, very heavy. Don't want to be lugging that around in my back. So what we want to do is we want to do a fuel value comparison and say, which fuel is going to give me the most energy for the least amount of weight? Okay, that's what fuel value is referring to. So when I do this per gram of something, per, per gram of a substance, what we're noticing is that the, uh, the fuel value of hydrogen, actually per gram, we're going to get almost three times the amount of energy per gram than we would if we had a gram of octane. So I'm looking at this and I'm saying, okay, if I put 100 grams in my backpack, I'm going to carry hydrogen around with me. Because for the same mass, I'm going to get three times the amount of energy for the same mass. And the reason for that, of course, is because hydrogen is so light, very light fuel. You have to put it in a weather balloon and it floats, right? So very light fuel, but yet it, um, it has three times the amount of energy. Now let's think about it. If we look at the fuel value data and we want to send a rocket up in orbit, Fuel is very, very heavy. We don't want to be carrying all that weight around. So what we do is rather than have the, the, the rocket filled with kerosene or octane or gasoline or something like that, very, very heavy fuel, what we do is we fill it up with hydrogen so we can carry three times the amount of energy. So technically speaking, for a third of the mass, we get three times the propulsion. And that's what fuel value means to us here. So this is why they would use um, liquid hydrogen in the rockets as opposed to using kerosene or gasoline, jet fuel, right? Jet fuel is very heavy. Okay, smaller fuel load means a larger payload. So if we can take, if we wanted to take the same amount of, of energy, we could get away with a third of the mass of hydrogen. So instead of using all that energy for, for carrying around fuel, we can carry more of a payload, which is going to make it a more of a paying trip. There we go. So fuel values. Okay. Um, fueling your body. Okay, let's have a look and see what this means for food and whatnot. Okay, so cellular respiration, we're talking about this again. We looked at that in the last lesson. And what's happening, of course, here is that the, um, as you burn the, the carbohydrates or fats or proteins in your body for fuel, what you're doing is you're energizing ATP molecules. And it's the ATP molecules, of course, that would go around your body and, and, um, and drive the many chemical reactions, muscle contraction, protein synthesis, DNA synthesis, and all these different things are activated by the ATP, which would come from a complicated series of steps uh, from the burning of sugar. Okay? And this equation for respiration here is the reverse of photosynthesis, and it's the same amount of energy, except it's exothermic. So we talked about that in the last lesson. So here we go. Um, we want to do some food calorimetry here too because we really want to know the amount of food energy in, say, a box of cereal. All right? If we're going to take a bowl of cereal, 
how do they actually determine how many calories or how many kilojoules is in that serving of cereal? And what they actually do here is they do bomb calorimetry on this. All right, so they're going to take a, a sample of the cereal, they're going to weigh it out, and they're going to put it in a bomb calorimeter and they're going to ignite it. They're going to burn it in the bomb calorimeter and they're going to figure out how much energy is released. Now, one of the things that you have to watch out for here is that if I take a banana or an orange or an apple and say I want to figure out how much food energy is in a banana, it's like burning wet firewood. Any of you guys who have wood stoves or anything like that, you know if you go out and cut green firewood that's really, really wet, it doesn't burn very well. And what happens is you hear a, a sissing sound coming from the wood. So what's happening is all of that water vapor and sap and everything that's in that piece of wood, the very first thing that has to happen is all that water has to boil and vaporize and remove itself from the wood before the wood can catch on fire. So what we want to do is we want to keep our calculations as simple as we can. So rather than put a wet banana in the bomb calorimeter, which is going to be very difficult to burn, what we do is we dehydrate it to remove all of the, all of the water so that none of the energy is going to go into actually vaporizing the water because there's no water left. Any energy that releases from this burning of the banana is coming from the dried banana. Okay, so we dehydrate the food first. Here's an example then of where fuel value has to come into play. Because just like um, our juice pack and everything else, do we really know what chemicals are involved in, say, a granola bar or a banana? There's, there's hundreds of different chemicals. You know, a granola bar has wheat, it has oat, it has raisins, it has nuts, it has honey, it has syrup, it has you name it in a granola bar. But we still want to know how much energy we're going to get from that. So here's an example where they took um, they took a granola bar and they weighed out an accurate 2.5 gram sample. And they're going to take that, dry it out, dehydrate it, put it in a bomb calorimeter, and we know the, ca the heat capacity of the bomb calorimeter. Um, and we're going to combust it, and we find that the temperature of the calorimeter increases by 3.86. We want to calculate the number of calories in a 23 gram bar. Okay? The only thing we burn, though, we only burn the 2.5 gram sample. We didn't burn the whole entire bar. So any heat energy we're going to get here is from the sample and not the entire bar. So we're going to have to do a calculation based on the entire bar after. So let's have a look at this. This is typical calorimetry. And in this case, we're burning a bar, so the bar becomes the system. The surroundings is going to be the bomb calorimeter. What do we know about the bar? Well, we know how big the bar is, but we're not burning the entire bar, are we? We're only burning 2.5 grams of the bar, and, and that's all we know about the bar. We, don't, we can't calculate the number of moles here because, you know, as we said, there's many different ingredients in it. Uh, what do we know about the bomb calorimeter? Well, we know the heat capacity of the calorimeter. It's 13.17. And we know the temperature change of the calorimeter. It went up by 0.386. So can we calculate this? Well, Again, these questions work by, by basically going backwards. And let's see if I can work it backwards for you. We want to be able to figure out the energy from the bar, the total mass of the bar. So we need to be able to calculate the fuel value. We need to know how much energy is in one gram of the bar. So we need to calculate fuel value. Q of the bar. We can get that because we know how much energy was absorbed by the calorimeter. The mass of the sample was given, so that's easy enough. And we can figure out the energy absorbed by the calorimeter because um, you know it's kilojoules per degree Celsius. There's no mass here, so we don't care about how heavy the bomb calorimeter is. It's not based on the mass. It's only based on the kilojoules per degree Celsius. So we can easily calculate everything we need here. So the very first thing you do is calculate the um, heat capacity, or sorry, the heat that was absorbed by the calorimeter. So C cal times delta T, 13.17 times 3.86, and it works out to be a gain of 50.84 kilojoules. All right. Now that we know how much energy was absorbed by the calorimeter, we can simply say that, yeah, well, where did that energy come from? Right? First law of thermodynamics. It came from the bar. So we know that the bar released 50.84 kilojoules. Now we have all the information we need in order to calculate the fuel value of the bar, because that 2.5 gram sample released 50.84 kilojoules. So the bar has a fuel value of 20.33. Now we normally don't put the negative sign there, uh, because it's given that food always 
is going to release energy when it's burnt, right? It's always going to be a negative value. So the fuel value is always assuming that that's the stored energy in the bar. Okay. What we want to do now is say, well, how much energy was that for the entire bar? Because we know that 20.33 kilojoules comes from from one gram. How much energy will we get for 23 grams? So simply, we're going to say, what's the energy? The fuel value times the total mass. So it's going to be 20.33 times 23 gram bar, and it works out to be 467.6 kilojoules if we eat the entire bar. Not bad. Good energy source if you're out hiking or skiing or out in the woods, you know. Lots of good energy there in a granola bar. Now we're not finished the question, are we? Because if you look at the question, we've calculated the kilojoules in that bar. The question asks us to calculate the calories. So we're saying that's no big deal. One calorie is 4.184 kilojoules. We know that we got 467 kilojoules, so we're simply going to divide. Okay, so 467 divided by 4.184, and it works out to be 112 calories. Okay, there we go. So could they give you this test, this question on a test? It's excellent. It 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 tests you on fuel values. It tests you on calorimetry, and that little conversion there, right? So nice little question here. This is is hitting two or three different areas of the course, right? So possibly it could be a good question. Okay, here's another one. Four nine four. Now some of you guys may be familiar with this. Anyone who, who's working out a lot and exercising and who's really counting their calories, but doesn't want to sit down with a calculator and start doing fuel values and things like that, because that could get real time consuming. Do you have to do that for every single thing you eat? All right, if you're going to do it very accurate, you do. But there's a way that we can estimate the amount of energy that we're consuming, and it's called the 494 method. And what it's based on is the idea that, on average, um, it's going to be based on the mass of carbohydrates, fat, and protein. Now, you know if you go back and look at that food nutrition thing right here, the nutrition labels um, generally give you the amount of carbohydrates. But they don't generally say what the source of the carbohydrates is or what type of sugar. It might be maltose or sucrose or glucose. It could be starch. It could be any form of, of sugar or carbohydrate there. So they don't really tell us what form of carbohydrate it is. They just say it's 18 grams of carbohydrates. And they generally tell us that we, you know, how much fat is in your, in your food that you're eating. And it really doesn't tell us what type of fat. It simply tells us if it's saturated trans fat or unsaturated or things like that. So it could be a blend of different different lengths of chains of fat. And also it gives us a level of protein. And it doesn't really tell us what amino acids are there or, or what type of protein is there. It's just giving an average of, of three grams of protein. So what we're going to do is we're going to look at this and we're going to say, all right, on average, if we could average all the different types of sugars and starches that might be in your diet, the average amount of energy per gram of carbohydrate is 4.2. The average amount of energy from fat is 9.1. Ah. So if you're eating fatty foods, you're getting twice the amount of energy that you would if it was um, uh, carbohydrates, like rice or pasta and things like that, All right, because there's more energy in fat per gram. Um, and last but not least, of course, protein, again, is very similar to the uh, carbohydrate. It's 4.2 calories per gram. So what we're going to do is we're going to look at the gram of each substance in our food and to do a quick uh, calculation in our head to get an average or an estimate of, of a, you know, handy about how much energy is in our food. So here's how it works. If we go back and look at that juice pack and just record our data, what we're saying is we've got 18 grams of carbs, we got 0.5 grams of fat, and 3 grams of, of protein. So I'm going to multiply the 18 by, by 4, or 4.2. Easier to do just 4. And you know that every time you estimate here, you're estimating a little bit low. So if I multiply 18 by 4, or 4.2, I get 72 calories. And then I'm going to multiply my fat by 9, or 9.1, all right, 4.5 calories. And then finally, I'm going to multiply my protein by 4.2, or just 4. Um, and what we do is we simply add up the energy from all these sources. And lo and behold, we get about 88.5 calories. Now you notice we're a little bit high. That juice pack has a reading of 80 calories. We're a little bit high here, but that's probably because you know it depends on the type of carb. It depends on the type of fat or protein. 
So again, it's just an estimate, but we're in the ballpark, right? We're in the ballpark. And for some people, that's what you need to know. You need to estimate what your your caloric intake is, right? Especially if you're a if you're a high level athlete and you don't have your pocket calculator handy with you and you want to go out for supper somewhere, and, you know, you can you can do the, these calculations in your head for the most part. There we go. Okay. Last but not least. All right. Here we've got a nutrition label. We want to look at how much energy is in a pack of potato chips. Big game on tonight. As I speak here now, the Boston Bruins have laced it up and they've already warmed up. And by the time you guys probably read this, it could be baseball season. But in any case, you're sitting down on the couch tonight waiting for the Boston game to work to get going here. And um, you got a pack of crusty potato chips here. It looks like uh, something from The Simpsons, right? Um, and it says on the package it's 28 grams serving, approximately 20 chips. And it says the calorie content in one serving is 644 kilojoules. Okay, so the question they're asking you is, okay, how much, how many, how many servings are in a single bag of chips? And we're saying if one serving is 28 grams and the bag is 270 grams, that's almost 10 servings, isn't it? So we can do a quick calculation saying, okay, 270 grams, one serving is 28 grams, so it's almost 10 servings in one bag. Okay. So it's a real good game. You're getting into the game. Period one's over. You eat a few handfuls of chip. Period two, getting real exciting. You eat another couple handfuls of chip. Period three, and you look in the bottom of the bag, and the chips are all gone. So you've consumed the full big bag of chips. And we want to say, well, how much energy have you just consumed? All right. Well, if one serving has a calorie content of 644 kilojoules, or 154 calories, depending on how you want to calculate it, You've just eaten 9.6 servings. So how much energy would be consumed? And that's a real simple calculation, right? You know that one serving is 644 kilojoules, and you've just consumed the entire bag, so you've consumed roughly 6,208 kilojoules. That's a lot. Okay. Uh, how many calories is that? Well, you could divide that by 4.184. And that works out to be 1,483 calories. All right, because you're going to divide that by 4.184. That's a lot. Your, your daily intake of calories for an average person is 2,000. All right, that bag of chips, you've already consumed 1,500 calories. Whoa. Okay. So I think I just did the, uh, I did the same calculation. What do we do here? Okay, how many calories? Right on. I just done it on the bottom there. Okay, I was ahead of myself. So we just converted that to calories on the bottom there. So it works out to be 1,483 calories. That's a lot of calories. Okay, not to mention that great big bottle of pop that you just drank to wash it down, right? Uh, so you can calculate the energy of that yourself too. Okay, um, so the question would be, okay, what what kind of physical activity? Obviously, the game is over now. Boston has trounced Tampa Bay like 10 to 1 or something like that in my dream, you say. So you might say, well, what type of activity do I have to do in order to burn off all that excess energy I just consumed? I'm going to bed. I'm not going to burn very much of it off at all. Um, here are some activities that you can look at. And these guys are listed kilojoules per hour is right here and calories per hour in brackets. So we've just consumed um, how many calories, how many kilojoules? Uh, 6,000 kilojoules. So we're looking at the type of activities. We can go do aerobics for an hour, two hours. We can go play basketball, depending how strenuous we play it. right? If we just go and shoot a few hoops, we're not going to burn much energy. But if we get into a full all-out brawl, then it's going to be a lot of energy. right? Good game going. Um, cycling on a bicycle, rowing machine, running, running really fast, walking kind of slow, uh, gardening, doing a lot of lifting, shoveling, stooping. Okay, and what we're saying here is some of these activities depend, of course, on your on your metabolism and how well you burn energy and what your your level of fitness is and all that stuff. Um, some people who are a little bit out of shape and whatnot are going to be working a lot harder. Um, and therefore may burn a few more calories, whereas someone who's in really good shape, um, it's easier to do work, so you don't burn as much energy, right? So it depends on your body state and you know your level of, of um, activity and your and your uh, 
caloric intake and all that stuff. Okay, so here's a few calculations that I should have covered over. Let me just cover over these guys, and there we go. All right, so the very first thing says, okay, I'm going to go out for uh, a real little brisk run. Okay, nice little jog, 10 kilometers an hour. Fast walking is like six kilometers an hour. So this is a nice little trot, little jog, and I'm going to burn 3,000 kilojoules per hour by jogging. So the time that I have to jog for is going to be the total energy divided by my energy consumption. So I, I just consume 6,000 kilojoules. I'm only burning 3,000 per hour. So I have to run for almost two hours to burn off that bag of chips. And it's like, wow, two hours of running? That's a lot. Okay, how far can I run in two hours? Well, if I'm running 10 kilometers per hour, I'm going to have to run 20 kilometers. That's half a marathon. It's like wicked. Uh, I'm not going to eat no more chips. How about if I jump in the boat and row across the harbor? Well, same sort of thing. I burn a little more energy because I'm using more muscles. I'm working a little harder. I'm using my back and my arms and my legs. Um, so I'd have to row back and forth for a total of 1.77 hours. That's a lot of pedaling. And finally, if I go out for a brisk walk, six kilometers an hour, six kilometers per hour, you're going to have a job talking to the person next to you. You're going to be out of breath if you talk. So that's pretty quick. Um, and what we have to do here is that's only going to consume 1,600 kilojoules. So I'd have to walk for 3.71 hours. How far would I have to walk? 22 kilometers. That's a lot of walking. I walk for about 20 minutes and I get beat out, let alone for 3.71 hours. So. Uh, I guess the moral of the story is don't eat the whole bag of chips. Anyways, that's enough for me. Over and out, and I'll see you guys in Electrochem. Bye-bye.